Happy Black History Month. <laughs> um, uh, part of the reason that I showed that was because it is Black History Month. Um, maybe a bigger reason um, <clears throat> has to do with the idea that I have a dream. For you. At some level, I, I kind of underst <clears throat> understand that everything that I'm visioning, envisioning for you, I'm probably not going to see. Totally. So it reminds me kind of, um, you know, my daughter or my son and my uh, daughter-in-law, Natalie and Ty, um, just had their second grandchild. Um, there are a number of things that are going to happen in those grandchildren's lives that I would like to see. But at some level, I realize I'm not going to be able to see, just from a time perspective. So I would like to see my granddaughter married. Right? I would like to be there. Right? But since she is two, or getting ready to turn two, there is a real good possibility that won't happen. It doesn't mean that I don't, that I'm not dreaming for that. So, so when I talk about dreams and dreams for you guys, I'm not talking about the type of dreams where you go to sleep at night and then experience something. I'm talking about the type of dreams that we have for our kids. Amen. That somehow or another, we have dreams of what will be. Whether or not we actually are around to see it or not. And Martin Luther King was just a, a really, and, and certainly there's, members or people in the Bible who are very similar to this, but more contemporary, um, that, that he somehow or another was a catalyst to a lot of the things, especially in African-American lives, that we benefit from today that he didn't get to see. Amen. Amen. But he saw it yes. Yes. from the mountaintop when he looked over and saw what was promised. So there are some things that I am real sure about. Um, I have probably never been more sure about a teaching or a sermon than I am about this one, about what I see for Christ's church at the Grove moving forward. <clears throat> um, this word uh, actually kind of started with Sister Wanda. Who was here when Sister Wanda spoke? <clears throat> Sister Wanda, and we've kind of been, yeah, kind of um, repeating the same kind of topic um, as it relates to uh, Corinthians. I don't know, if, if people who are around a lot know that Corinthians keeps coming up. You know, it came up with Sister Wanda first. It, you know, somehow or another it resonated with Pastor Ben. Um, uh, and certainly, you know, it, it's been resonating with me. And I, I wasn't really sure, <clears throat> you know, why it was resonating so much. Because if you look at the Corinthian church and somehow or another do a basic comparison to our church, your initial your initial thoughts would be, oh, we're nothing like that. I, I want to suggest to us for a moment that maybe we are more like that than we want to admit. <clears throat> so, a lot of us here, and, and, and once again, not going to do the hand thing, um, but I, I'm sure a number of us here uh, 
as we were coming to church, we're planning the rest of our day based on what our church normally looks like. That somehow or another what you're going to be doing after church is somehow based on what we typically do here, especially from a time perspective. <clears throat> Let me suggest to you that while we are real, real clear about the idea that Satan is seeking who he may devour and destroy as his mission. That Jesus Christ has a mission also. And in the process, he is seeking congregations that are prepared and willing to have a visitation from him. Amen. Prepared and willing. How many people know that'll mess your afternoon up when that happens? Your plan for your afternoon when that happens. All right. <clears throat> So one of, in one of our most recent um, elders meetings, uh, one of the things that probably didn't come up, I guess I brought it up, um, was the idea that, um, you know, you often ask, you, you know, what, exactly what am I doing up here? You know what I mean? If I were to kind of go around the room and say, oh, you know, what, what's Greg doing? What's, what, what am I doing? Um, well, let me just say this. I'm doing one of two things, okay? I'm either teaching or I'm preaching. Right? I'm doing one of those two things, right? And what I'm actually doing has very little to do with what I'm going to say, but has everything to do with where you are in Christ. Because we teach the saved and we preach to the lost. And this is why. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught, by, taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritual taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolish and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So if you think about it, and you've heard this said many, many times, that God wants to do a work from the inside out for believers. God does a work from the outside in for the lost, because no one come to the Father unless he be not inside out, outside in. <clears throat> and and, and we'll, we'll talk about the phenomenon of whether you're being preached to or whether you're being taught here today a, a, a little later. Um, but understand this, that I'm, there's only two things for me to be up to up here on this Sunday morning. That is either to teach or to preach. And whether or not I'm doing that, in your particular case, depends on where you are. Amen. 
All right, so that's, this is kind of the title of my sermon, whatever. <clears throat> God is up to something. Folks, and, and once again, um, this is a word for Christ Church at the Grove. First and foremost, individually, and then collectively. Because nothing happens collectively without it first happening individually. Amen. That somehow or another we've got it backwards, that somehow or another something great is going to happen collectively, which is going to affect us individually. No, no, no. Something happens great individually, which ultimately has a positive effect collectively. So I, I say God is up to something because with question marks, because what is it? Because it's, it's kind of nice, and we all would probably agree, God is up to something. Is there a time when really he isn't? The, the question becomes, for us as a congregation, and for us individually, when you figure out what God is up to with you, then we will, as a congregation, figure out what God is up to with us. Amen. <clears throat> so, question mark. <clears throat> so, God is up, up to something, question mark. Christ Church at Grove, I think that's where we are. God is up to something, exclamation point, I think is where we want to be. <laughs> Right? I think that's what we want to be. <clears throat> Logical question, right? Who, who, who was thinking that, you know, as they, as they saw that, right? Logical, well, how do we get there? We get there by being, and once again, you could use a lot of words for this, but you get there by being over-the-top Christians. <clears throat> Explain a little bit what I mean by that. <clears throat> Um, I was happy, but not surprised, by the comments almost from the time Moise got up here till the time Eddie was talking, and to the point where I actually said to my, my wife, Moise is preaching my sermon. And my wife said, tell her to sit down. <laughs> No, no, no. But, but, but it, 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 it's, 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 once again, I'm happy, but I'm not surprised. Because the Spirit always flows that way. Amen. Always. The Spirit is never at odds with itself. All right, so I, I tell my wife all, all the time, okay, you want to do this, I want to do that. One of us is wrong. <laughs> Because if you're feeling this from the Spirit, and I'm feeling this from the Spirit, we know that the Spirit is never at odds with itself. One of us is off. Right? Right. So, so somehow or another, it is the primary responsibility of the leaders, the spiritual leaders within, the, within Christ Church at the Grove, to kind of figure out what the Spirit's up to. <clears throat> Before we get to that. <clears throat> so, over the top Christian. Uh, Eddie touched on it. We know what over the top people look like as it relates to specific things in life. Eddie touched on it with sports. Yeah. Right? That you, you, it's real easy for us at any given point to look at a sports fan and say, oh, he's over the top. <laughs> Right? Like, it, it's, it's clear to us. Or to look at somebody like myself who's not really a sports fan and say, not so much. Right? So as people, people ought to be able to relatively easily look at us and say that we're over the top. Not because we're weird. Not because we shove it down their throat. Not because... We don't associate with them if they don't see things exactly the way we see it. But because there's something about us, there's something about what eludes and emulates out of us 
that says, hey, this person is really over the top about their faith. Without necessarily even have to, having to say anything directly about your faith. Just your facial expressions. Um, you, you know, it's funny. I don't know if Chip does it anymore, but in sports, I, uh, and I've seen other people do that. He, sometimes, you know, you'll see sports fans on the TV, they'll get down on one knee, like right in front of the, like right in front of the, top. they, they want to see, right? This is getting ready to, they're anticipating. They're anticipating something great or potential happening. <clears throat> you still don't <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But folks, once again, as a congregation, the Spirit of God will move on this congregation as individuals become over the top about their faith. Because he's looking, because here's kind of the, the difference between Satan and Jesus Christ, is Satan is like a roaring lion. And he'll come in and he'll interject himself where he's not welcome. Jesus Christ is like a meek lamb. That he will not interject himself into this congregation unless this congregation wants it. Unless he looks at this congregation and says, they are hungry for me. Once again, the song that we sang. I'm desperate for you. Are we? <clears throat> we know it's the right thing to say. Song we sang before that. You give me all the riches of. As a congregation, we love that song. And we are grateful that he gives us all the riches of him. But there has to be a corresponding response to the fact that he gives us all the riches of him, which is that we give him all the riches of You get it. Do we get it enough to practice it? <clears throat> so, you know, once again, Pastor Ben had a sermon. Um, which was an accurate sermon, and certainly we understand it, that we, are we called to do it all? So if I was to ask the congregation, in general, are we called to do it all? That's what I thought you would say. Except, I say yes. <laughs> And this is why I say yes. And no. Are we called to do it all? Yes. And no. We are called to do it all, to do all that God has called us to do. So we are called to do it all. We are called, each individual is called to do all that God has called you to do. Amen. You, we are not called to do all that needs to be done. That's the difference. So on the one hand, we're never called to do all that needs to be done in the sense of that all. But we are called to do all as it relates to us Individually. <clears throat> so God wants his Holy Spirit To flow. <clears throat> if I were to ask um, who's interested in quenching the Holy Spirit's fire, 
I'm pretty sure I would not see a hand. If I were to ask who has participated in quenching the Holy Spirit's fire for not living up to everything God has called them to be, every hand ought to go up, including my own. So while we can acknowledge that we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit's fire, we also have to acknowledge that we have been a part of quenching the Holy Spirit's fire. As it relates to you individually and as it relates to Christ Church of the Grove as a congregation. Now, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are, they are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. <laughs> no. let's, not, let's not go past that too quick. Thank you. <laughs> let us sink in a little bit. <laughs> There's a lot there. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> next time, honey, I'll get a clicker. Thank you. Um, so ultimately, folks, the way we're going to get to where we need to be individually and as a congregation uh, is through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And to the level that we're willing to walk by the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is not constantly vying against what you want to do, then that's false. If you think just because you're showing up on Sunday that somehow or another you are in agreement with this portion of Scripture, you're, you're kidding yourself. That is a battle going on between the flesh and the spirit that is constant and continuous irrespective of where you find yourself on Sunday. Amen. <clears throat> okay. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft hatred, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Who's actually physically looking at that passage of scripture right now in their Bible? But you ought to know something. You notice something? Somebody let me know what's different about this as opposed to what you're looking at. Oh, you better believe it's the list. <laughs> there's, some, there's some things missing. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, right. Folks, if you have your Bibles open and you're following along, this is, not, this is an incomplete list. All right? But... This is what we like to look at and say, that's not me. So somehow or another, because this particular list doesn't normally apply to us, congregationally, individually, that we're okay. Except, this is what's left out of the list. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Discord. I separated them from the list, but it's not separated in the Bible. Amen. Wonder if we had any, any discord in our congregation. Jealousy. Got any of that going on? Fits of rage. Selfish ambition.
dissension. Factions. Clicks. Envy. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom. Folks, when you separate that stuff out, it takes on a little different meaning. So, hey, no orgies for me. Let's move, let's read on. Right? Let's move, let's move on. Right? No debauchery for me, no drunkenness for me. Let's move on. Next scripture, please. Right? Because this is our normal human tendency. This is the spirit at odds with the flesh, that the flesh says, I'm okay. That's, that's the battle. The, the battle is the I'm okay battle. And when you say I'm okay, you will not be desperate for him because you're okay. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to the Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we believe, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen. <clears throat> Go ahead, Dan. <clears throat> you know, I um, I often go to um, <clears throat> first century church. Acts, first century church. Um, to just reconfirm and, re and, and re-verify what I already know is that first century church is and looks like 21st century church. Or is this 22nd? No, 21st century church, right? That, that the specifics may be a little different, but the spirit that is controlling what's going on at actually it ends up being kind of the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, <clears throat> telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Once again, folks, as we read that, you have to understand that, that at that time, that was a big deal. That, that, that was a big deal that somehow or another this was not for just the Jews, but it was for the Gentiles. We don't make a big deal out of that today. Well, of course it was for both. What we have to kind of acknowledge, though, is that if first century church had a similar phenomenon where it wasn't so obvious who the gospel was for. <laughs> that maybe 21st century church is having a similar phenomenon and we're not real clear about who the gospel is for. <clears throat> so when they figured it out, it says the Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believe and turn to the Lord. Folks, here's what we're looking for. We want the Lord's hand to be with us. Amen. Lord's hand will not be with us until you have Lord's hand with you. Go ahead, Jane. <clears throat> News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When, they, uh, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged, about, and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. 
He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. <clears throat> the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. <clears throat> Why do, do you think I highlighted? Were the Christians calling themselves Christians or were others calling them Christians? Seems like it was others, right? So the problem that we're having, once again, you know, and, and kind of let me just say this. I am called to be an elder of the church, capital C. I am called to be an elder of the church, primarily ministering to this congregation, church, lower city. Because we all understand that we are just a little part of the big picture. So one of the problems we have, and once again, capital C church, Little C Church, is that we are way, way too willing to self-identify ourselves as Christians. When the bigger issue and the bigger thing would be, do the people you come in contact with, do the people who know you the best identify you that way? Do they call you Christian based on your behavior? Not do you call yourself Christian. That when you can get to a place where people are calling you Christian just from the idea that they, can't, they couldn't possibly call you anything else based on how you live and, and what you talk and, and, and your speech and, and, and the idea that I'm not going to have a conversation with you longer than 15 minutes before Jesus is coming up. Jesus is coming up at some point. Very soon. <clears throat> And once again, folks, Christ church had to grow. You, you don't wait for stuff to be a problem before you warn people about the potential problem. Amen. Now, you, you think about your kids. Do you wait for your kids to do something wrong? before you tell them about wrong things? Well, of course not. That would be r ridiculous, right? Do you teach your kids not to touch the stove after they've been burnt? No. You tell the kids, hey, hot. Don't touch. Hot. Even when it's not hot. You say hot. Don't, it's not a good idea. Just don't touch. Right? It's the stove. May be on, may not be on. <clears throat> When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. This is kind of when Paul was um, kind of in the midst of his, his battle and, uh, you know, the Jews were not happy with him at this point. Um, so they sent him in front of, you know, the higher, higher powers. Um, but when these higher powers kind of heard what the Jews were actually charging him with, they were a little confused <laughs> about what the problem was. They, could, they didn't get it. Um, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. This is Festus, I think, talking, um, one of the Roman magistrates. Uh, instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. <clears throat> Folks, as a congregation, as individuals, Jesus can start to become to us just a dead man 